This video is about a section in a book I wrote. The book is called Explanations and Corrections in the Gospel of Luke. And I'll be reading part of a chapter or section of the book called Mark 13, 14 and Matthew 24, 16 are addressed to unbelievers. In section 150 of book two of the Harmony of the Gospels, Augustine of Hippo expressed confusion about Luke 21, 21. He wouldn't have made the comment if he had understood what Luke meant. Augustine said, how does this third evangelist say here, let them depart out, when he has already used these terms, when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with an army. The difficulty is to see how those who are in the midst of it are to depart out when the city is already compassed with an army. And that's the way that Augustine understood the verse somewhere around 400 AD is probably the most common way that Christians understand that verse and it's wrong because he he correctly imagined that the apostles were going to see that army, but he incorrectly imagined that the apostles were going to be in Jerusalem. So the chapter continues. Earlier I quoted from an encyclopedia that mentioned the theory that the Roman standards were a signal for Christians to flee to Pella. Here is a longer quotation about that subject from the article under the entry Pella in McClinic and Strong, but I'm not going to read that because it's long and I'm trying to keep the chapter is the chapter is so long it's going to take two episodes anyway. But I object to the interpretation above. I say that Jesus never directed the disciples to flee to the mountains. The Catholic Encyclopedia further explains the tradition about Christians fleeing from Jerusalem in its article under the head in Pella. And again, I'm not going to read that. But if you don't remember enough about the tradition about the flight to Pella, look up those terms in an internet search, flight to Pella, or even look at the Wikipedia article, flight to Pella, it tells a little about it. But there's been at least one book written about the tradition. As the encyclopedia says, a lot of Christian tradition originated in the writings of Eusebi Eusebius and a Epiphanius. But I am contradicting ecclesiastical tradition in saying that the Gospels didn't record any prophecy that Christians should flee from Jerusalem at some signal or flee to Pella. The command in Mark 13 14 and the similar passages in Mark and Matthew and Luke are exhortations addressed to all of those Judeans against whom the vengeance of God was going to come. Those words weren't spoken in the second person to his apostles who were present, nor were they spoken to future Jerusalemite Christians, but the words were spoken to an unbelieving audience which was not present. Verses 15 and 16 of Mark 13 were moved to Luke 17 because they apply to all believers who were to be saved, and not only to believers in Jerusalem. Mark 13, 17 is talking about Jerusalem again, so it describes the woes to women with children. In severe sieges in ancient times, if the siege wasn't lifted, and if the besieged people didn't surrender, the besieged would see the children starve to death. Luke detected something wrong with Mark 13, 14 through 17. But when ye see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let him, let them that are in Judea flee unto the mountains, and let him that is on the housetop not go down, nor enter in, nor take anything out of his house, and let him that is in the field 
not return back to take his cloak. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them given suck in those days. The words that are underlined above are authentic words of Jesus. But they were spoken on another occasion, not during Jesus' prophecy about the destruction of the temple. After removing the, the verses that didn't belong, Luke added explanatory comments of his own, comments probably not spoken by Jesus, comments not found in Mark or Matthew, while writing Luke 21, 20 through 23. If Jesus' words had originally applied to Christians, Luke would have added different comments to make it clear. Below I put the words that Luke kept from Mark 13, 14, and 17, words, words which were really spoken during Jesus' speech about the time of the destruction of the temple in bold. And I underlined the exegetical comments that Luke inserted. So this first sentence, but when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies that know that her desolation is at hand, uh, many people recognize that that was a substitute for Mark's comments about the abomination of desolation, and it's easier to understand. So in bold, then let them that are in Judea flee into the mountains, just like it says in Mark. So Luke found no objection to it. And then Luke said, and let them that are in the midst of her depart out, and not let them that are in the country enter therein. For these are days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Well, that's in the same place as let him that is on the housetop not go down, etc. But it's not really a substitute for those words, since it has a different meaning. Luke moved those words over to Luke 17. And then in bold again, he kept these words of Mark. Woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress upon the land and wrath unto this people. Luke's comments underlined above occupied the place of the words that Luke, that Luke moved to the 17th chapter. They occupy the place of these that are in blue, highlighted in blue, but they have a different meaning. They are not a substitute for those words. These words were intended to prevent the reader from misunderstanding the exhortation to the Judeans. Flee into the mountains is the opposite of entering within the city walls of Jerusalem. The Roman armies would, would bring vengeance. Those armies wouldn't be defeated by an angel as in the time of Hezekiah and Sennacherib. The armies weren't going to leave a stone upon a stone in that temple that impressed the apostles so much. The women and children would suffer all the misfortunes brought by successful sieges. Compare Luke 19, 43 through 44, which is also about the predicted destruction, predicted destruction of Jerusalem and which is also silent about what would happen to Christians. And I could have added the similar words in Luke 23. John Chrysostom thought that the abomination of desolation was the Roman armies, and he understood the corresponding section of Matthew similarly to how I do. In his homily on Matthew 24, 16 through 18, which I will mention a little later, he said, Flee, therefore, then, saith he, for thenceforth there is no hope of safety for you. For since it had fallen out, that they often had recovered themselves in grievous wars, as under Sennacherib, under Antiochus again, for when at that time also armies had come in upon them, and the temple had been seized beforehand, the Maccabees, rallying, gave their affairs an opposite turn, in order then that they might not now also suspect this, 
that there would be any such change. He forbids them all thought of the kind. Um, so the Jews in Jerusalem were rescued from the Assyrian armies that Sennacherib brought in the time of Hezekiah. And during the time of the Maccabees, Judas Maccabeus rose up a rebellion uh, to drive the Greeks out, the Greeks that had defiled the temple. But And it would have been natural for the Jews to think they would get a salvation like that. But um, Chrysostom is saying that they should not get their hopes up. That's the meaning of Jesus' words. Now, I'm going to skip reading this to shorten the chapter. Luke removed those words about the man on the housetop and the man in the field from Luke 21 and put them in another speech where they belonged in Luke 17, in a speech which discussed the coming of the Son of Man and the salvation of believers. And he left only words pertaining to the doomed unbelievers in Luke 21, 21 through 27. It's not by chance that the verses in that section of Luke 21 are all in the third person. They are all about those who rejected the Son of Man. Not by accident, the second person verb, verbs used for the four apostles, which ceased after verse 20, resume in verse 28. Luke was not telling the Christians how to save themselves in the section of his speech with verbs in the third person. When the disciples saw the Roman armies besieging Jerusalem, the apostles were simply to know that the desolation of Jerusalem was near, not its salvation, as happened in the days of Sennacherib. Jesus expected his apostles to know that. He didn't tell them to flee. He didn't suggest that they would be inside of Jerusalem when they saw the armies. If not for Jesus' prediction, their natural instinct, like the instinct of any Judean, would have been to flee within the walls of Jerusalem for safety. Luke gave a lot of thought to his use of Mark in Matthew. He knew that Jesus' statements about the one on the housetop and in the field were in the context of the destruction of Sodom. The clauses removed from Mark are enclosed between references to the days of Lot and, and to Lot's wife. Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. Something similar would happen when the Son of Man is revealed. If the man on the housetop or in the field did not strictly obey the saving angels and went back into his house to get his goods. Mark 13, 15 through 16 does not tell Christian believers to look for some sign like the abomination of desolation before fleeing. These dislocated words belong to a speech in which Christians are told that the Son of Man will save them in a miraculous manner similar to the salvation of Lot and his family. You don't need a sign when an angel, angel confronts you and tells you to flee. Lot's wife is the type. Christians who fail to obey the angels and lose salvation are the anti-type. And they are told to flee without hesitation, keeping in mind the story of Lot's family. Luke 17 mentions Noah and Lot. Neither Noah nor Lot looked for a sign. Jesus' words about the man on the housetop and in the field may have been inspired by the fact that Lot didn't immediately obey the angels. Genesis 19.16 reads, But he lingered, and the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters. The miraculous salvation promised in Luke 17 is briefly mentioned again, in Luke 21, 28, where the verbs change from the third person to the second person. And I'm going to have to end this video now and, uh, and explain the just third person commands in another YouTube episode.